speaker uh, of today's uh, panel session. Um, so our sen second speaker is Professor uh, Pierluigi uh, uh, Mancarilla uh, Man uh, from the University of uh, Melbourne. And uh, uh, Pierluigi, he's a chair professor um, of uh, electric power systems at the University of uh, Melbourne in Australia. And also, um, he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's a professor of smart uh, energy systems at the uh, University uh, of Manchester, where um, he, uh, um, before he moved to, uh, to um, Australia, he uh, worked uh, in Manchester. So he received his uh, uh, education, um, uh, uh, MSc and a PhD in power systems uh, from the uh, Polytechnical University uh, 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 Torino in Italy um, before he joined Imperial College as a um, postdoc researcher. And he um, also um, held a, a number of visiting positions at the, uh, in the US and uh, China, France, uh, and Norway and Chile and and so um, he's um, he's well known for his research um, um, uh, on the uh, 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 multi energy system uh, and security. He his research uh, interests is uh, include uh, includes technical uh, uh, and economic modeling of integrated multi energy systems and security and reliability and the resilience of uh, future uh, networks, uh, a grid integration of renewables and uh, low carbon technology and uh, energy infrastructure planning and uncertainty. So he has been involved uh, in uh, leading uh, um, around uh, 50 research projects uh, uh, worldwide. He's author of uh, um, uh, several books and over um, 300 research uh, publication so very productive and uh, he's also an editor um, of the HV transaction on power systems, HV transaction on smart grid and the HV uh, systems journal. Uh, Pierluigi is uh, an HV power and energy society uh, distinguished uh, lecturer and holds the um, 2017 uh, Whiskey Innovation Fellowship uh, by the Victorian uh, government in Australia for his project on um, uh, urban scale uh, virtual power plants and is a recipient uh, of uh, an international uh, Newton Prize uh, 2018 for his work on power system resiliency in Chile. And uh, he also uh, led the um, Melbourne Energy Institute's work, power system security assessment of the future national electricity market um, in support of the uh, Australian and uh, chief scientist um, Finkel review. So uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Pierluigi. Thank you. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Can you hear me well? Yeah. And can, can, I, can you also see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Great. Okay, that's, that's great. So Perfect. I think uh, the, 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 the hardest part uh, has, has been done. Great. So uh, thanks a lot again for the introduction. Thanks for, for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here and to share some of, of our uh, ideas and uh, past and ongoing work about uh, uh, microgrids, which I wanted to put here in the context uh, of the uh, of the energy trilemma. So what 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 was this about? Uh, uh, in general, are we worried about uh, delivering low carbon energy system? Well, we know that via renewables, uh, we are uh, getting closer and closer to the the ambition of actually replacing uh, fossil fuels, at least uh, context of electricity system. But what are the challenges in doing that? So we normally describe this by the so-called and well-known energy trilemma. So how do we find an optimal trade-off uh, between uh, uh, affordability, decarbonization, reliability? Historically, the power system has been operating and designed as a, as a trade-off between uh, uh, the dilemma of reliability and affordability, security supply, uh, so keeping the lights on and having low-cost energy. And now there is decarbonization with renewables with a very different uh, uh, operational patterns and physical characteristics uh, that are introducing new challenges uh, in, in system operation. 
Now, this trilemma actually is seen in different ways depending on the context, depending on where, where you are. For example, if we take uh, an advanced country, uh, like, like for example the, the, the UK, probably the aspect of high, highest interest will probably be reliability, uh, or, or in other ways how the decarbonization of the electricity system may introduce uh, operating challenges that need to be dealt with uh, in real time and then after that in planning. And this may be a disaster of security and reliability may be actually even more important than uh, affordability. Uh, to put this in context, uh, uh, again, let's try to imagine in a very schematic way that uh, we look at the flexibility and security in general and its provision in terms of market services uh, in, uh, uh, in, um, in, in most countries, effectively. We know that uh, majority of the system services and flexibility either comes from flexible generation units or for systems that are interconnected uh, uh, will come through flexibility can be imported. So interconnectors effectively are a way to, to, to lend and to borrow some flexibility and uh, system services. Now, what happens when more and more renewables come into the system? Where well, one of the first effects uh, is the fact that these renewables are somehow displacing for the markets conventional generators uh, that have been the main providers of system services. And at the same time, renewables themselves are actually calling for new uh, services due to a number of changes uh, uh, in, in systems it said uh, uh, there, there may be for example interconnected by power electronics therefore there may be uh, issues with inertia uh, system strength and all that uh, because of the uh, partial variability and uncertainty uh, they may uh, require more reserves therefore more flexibility so in general there are greater flexibility and good services requirement, while at the same time, the traditional providers of flexibility and security services are actually disappearing from the market. So what, what happens if things are not done properly? Well, as you can imagine, if we do not have sufficient uh, security services, we may be quite some trouble and uh, you can imagine what can happen next. Again, this is highly uh, undesirable. And uh, if you think uh, that this is a far future, uh, it, it would have been probably a few years ago. I mean, these slides that we're just showing are the slides that we used to teach in our uh, courses on um, uh, smart grids courses at the University of Manchester a few years ago, but unfortunately now they have become reality. And in fact, uh, uh, if, if, if you look at this picture, this is, uh, the, the picture of the frequency when there was a system separation and uh, blackout uh, in uh, in South Australia in 2016, which actually started lots of discussions about uh, system security in Australia and how actually we could guarantee system security with greater uh, penetration of renewables. And now there is an ambition of, of reaching 75% renewable penetration in, in 2025. However, first of all, we need to fix all these issues with, with security, lack of inertia, issues with uh, uh, system strength uh, and, and all that. So how do we do that? Of course, we are engineers and uh, uh, we, we, we can do great, 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 great miracles sometime. So there is a problem, there is a solution that engineers will find. In this specific case, there are of course the new technologies that can help and uh, uh, for example, you will know the uh, amazing performance of uh, uh, new battery technologies. For example, the famous Tesla battery that been installed in, in South Australia, the 100 megawatt battery that uh, is operating with incredible speed uh, and effectively has uh, resolved many of the uh, system security issues uh, in, um, uh, in South Australia. However, is that it? We just need more batteries, or, or, or there is we are we are part of a of a greater transformation. Well, that's exactly what is happening. And just to give you a little bit of a more general perspective, let's look at uh, how the system is changing from the point of view of, of grid architecture, or provision of energy, and uh, again uh, flexibility and similar services. Historically, flexibility and grid services have been provided uh, from transmission system to a passive uh, 
distribution network. So effectively, power plants connected at, at the system at the transmission level were providing all controllability to a network uh, uh, in the dis a distribution network that, that was fundamentally inflexible, non-active, completely passive. Now things are changing because in a way the system, transmission system is becoming less and less flexible because of more and more renewables that, that uh, uh, being connected to transmission system requiring more flexibility rather than providing more flexibility. Of course, there are ways technology-wise for wind uh, and solar farms to provide system service. However, this is all happening and uh, still we, we need to bring uh, everything together. What is certain though, is that at the same time, there is a fundamental transformation that's also taking place uh, in uh, the uh, distribution system. I took here a, a picture from, very famous picture actually from the more microgrids project that uh, Professor Sergio was, was leading um, uh, well, t 10 years ago now, and which, uh, which I had the pleasure to be, to be part of at the time. So as you can see, if actually we are moving to, from, from a system that was historically, traditionally passive at the, the uh, distribution level to a much more active system where there are new resources uh, connected to, with quite some degree of controllability and flexibility, but it acknowledges, of course, uh, uh, solar panels, electric vehicles in the next future, more and more flexible resources available in households. And the idea is, uh, can we start aggregating, controlling these resources uh, with new uh, ar ar architecture approach, for example, by microgrids, and by the help of some distribution system operator. And then by aggregating more and more these resources uh, and uh, by local uh, uh, management from a commercial perspective and technical perspective, can we actually take this distributed digital energy systems and start providing system services overall? This, this is the concept somehow of a virtual power plant. So, so the idea of aggregating distributed energy resources that could be represented uh, uh, geographically as, as, as a microgrid, uh, for example, and then start providing system services. So as you can see, we, we now basically switched to the direction of flexibility because there are so many resources available distribution, um, distribution level that actually these resources can now be the new providers of, uh, uh, of, of flexibility. So the future very much looks something like this, uh, where once uh, the conventional generators have uh, disappeared or would disappear more and more from the markets, uh, actually we might rely on the very distributed energy systems to provide uh, uh, flexibility and system services. And then we talk about in general distributed energy resources, uh, microgrids, virtual power plants uh, on the electricity side. Uh, and then we could also link those uh, to the rest of the energy systems, heating, cooling, transport, uh, future fuels such as hydrogen, uh, what, what we call multi-energy system, which is again uh, a great uh, a source of flexibility owing to great uh, virtual storage opportunities that are embedded uh, in uh, other energy sectors and can be accessed uh, at uh, relatively low cost. So the future would see all these resources being aggregated, for example, in microgrids, potentially operating in virtual power plants, and then start interacting with uh, uh, the upstream system and the upstream markets. So in this context, the microgrid is really a deeply already part of the energy trilemma and somehow contributed to, to solving the energy trilemma. As put, as we put here, effectively we can look at microgrid operation opportunities as a trade-off between technical reliability aspects, economic aspects, environmental aspects inside the microgrid. But also we're saying, the microgrid itself is seen as interacting with the, with the rest of energy system. So some sort of active cell interacting with the upstream network and system can also provide opportunities for decarbonization and improvement of the technical aspects and improvement of the, of the economics of the overall system. So if we look at uh, somehow a kind of evolution roadmap, we see that microgrids may be developed first at the local level and then start contributing for the purposes of providing, for example, uh, economic benefits and reliability benefits locally. And then 
while they grow in scale, they can start more and more providing uh, reliability services to network, local network, and then at even larger scale services to the overall uh, system. So when you look at this uh, from local perspective, for example, one of the great benefits would be try to understand uh, how uh, local microgrids uh, could uh, improve the economics uh, of uh, the system by, for example, providing services uh, uh, and by participating in different markets. And uh, uh, an experiment that we are developing at the University of, of Melbourne is actually that sort of designing the new engineering campus, which is in this area. This is, this is the city of Melbourne, the uh, central business district of the city of Melbourne. This is the area where the new campus of engineering will be uh, developed about uh, 100 megawatts of load slash generation and the idea is uh, to develop it effectively as a, a virtual power plant where we would aggregate all the active resources uh, that would be installed in the campus would be a uh, recharging station for electric vehicles uh, so photovoltaics there would be uh, gas turbines and hydrogen turbines uh, battery and storage systems and all that and then see how the campus uh, uh, of the Faculty of Engineering could actually become a virtual power plant uh, that is embedded uh, in, uh, in, in, the city, in, in the center of, of the city. And when you look at that, uh, in fact, you would realize that the campus really can operate uh, as a virtual power plant. So what you can see here is uh, the active uh, reactive power maps of uh, the aggregation of the resources that will be in the, in the campus at different points in time where the grid areas effectively are the uh, entire feasibility regions uh, of the campuses and aggregate and uh, uh, these other um, these other areas that you can see in in blue dotted lines and all that they actually represent the flexibility regions so the uh, somehow the regions describing the ability of the campus to participate in system services. In this case, the possibility of providing frequency control and serial services for raised and lower primary and secondary frequency, frequency response. So we've done quite some advanced modeling, try to understand how effectively we could represent the campus as a, as, as a synchronous machine, as a virtual power plant, and then how we could actually accrue significant uh, uh, economic benefits, commercial benefits by participating uh, in multiple markets for, uh, for system services. Then the moment that you imagine you have this kind of microgrids with great flexibility, how could you think, uh, for example, of supporting the upstream network? And uh, I'm giving you here an example of some work we did at the University of Manchester with the Electrician Northwest uh, a few years ago, where effectively you will see a typical a, a typical scheme of a radial distribution network in the UK. Effectively, it's it's a loop network, but it is of course already radial in most cases. So imagine that uh, there is a fault in the network, and at the point uh, the circuit breakers will clear the fault, the microgrid in this case will go. Uh, I landed. Of course, it will provide reliability services to the customers inside the microgrid. Uh, however, what, there, there are two other things that the microgrid could do. One is uh, ideally with the proper schemes could actually be locally reconnected to the nearby areas and provided support to other communities. And at the same time, if the microgrid is seen as a demand response service itself, actually in planning already, there is the possibility of designing the whole scheme by already taking into account uh, the fact that the microgrid, in case of fault, uh, would disconnect uh, uh, itself from, from the main grid. So by doing this, effectively, you could uh, avoid having for N minus one uh, security purposes to um, oversize the two feeders, uh, because effectively you know that you may rely on the microgrid provided demand response Therefore, you can actually allow more customers to connect to the feeder uh, rather than just uh, having to, um, to, 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 to oversize the feeder uh, in, in the case of, of new connections. Further, as I said, going bigger and bigger, 
growing from now the network to the system level, there would be the possibility microgrids to provide, for example, uh, adequacy services and uh, reserve services. So, for example, imagine that again you have uh, community energy systems potentially operated as microgrids with the solar PV batteries and all that with certain characteristics. And the idea is uh, what is the ability of these uh, to provide? Uh, in the case uh, there is, for example, an extreme demand uh, contribution to supply uh, the system demand. And we performed uh, quite some analysis and there is, a, you, you can have a look at the papers. In fact, we try to understand with uh, sophisticated Monte Carlo uh, techniques, which effectively reflect the way the capacity markets are operating in the UK at the moment. What is the potential contribution of microgrids to adequacy of supply and ideally the potential for them to participate uh, uh, in, uh, in in capacity uh, in capacity markets. Of course, in this case, it's based on PV and batteries, but of course, they are more more general uh, microgrids that can be considered. In fact, uh, we we performed that study looking multi-energy microgrids uh, that were providing at the same time electricity and uh, and, and heating. Uh, as I said, this pretty much will be the perspective of the trilemma and the potential for distributed systems and microgrids to participate uh, in system services, really looking at reliability as a main issue. But uh, if we look at developing countries, for example, in many countries in Africa, probably the main point uh, is really looking for affordability. And if we look at affordability, for example, the question is, can microgrids support uh, electrification, for example, in Africa? And I'm putting here, some study that we performed for Senegal when a few years ago we participated in a competition at MIT, which by the way we won, where basically we proposed a tool that could, uh, uh, that, that, that could effectively demonstrate how you could provide uh, electrification for Senegal based uh, on a mix of resources and with great, uh, um, great role play, played by microgrid. As you can see here is basically the heat map of Senegal, whereby you can see in yellow basically the potential for uh, extension of high medium voltage level, then in uh, orange uh, the potential to provide sustainable electrification via uh, microgrid would be in the case diesel based, uh, they're not, not so sustainable potential, but at least we provide some electrification to villages that at the moment don't have it, and then actually going for something even more sustainable in red here, the great part of the country where we basically demonstrated uh, based on technoeconomic uh, engineering how we could uh, uh, de de design microgrid uh, based on uh, PV and battery uh, battery system, large, uh, large scale. It, with the same principle and uh, uh, in the same scheme uh, actually as, uh, uh, as, as, as uh, the, the the project uh, uh, of, of, of this workshop, we uh, we are now part of TERS project. Uh, TERS stands for Technical Economic Framework for Resilient and Sustainable Electrification, where we are basically studying the how we could provide uh, a sustainable electrification, but also resilience to um, uh, to rural areas. And uh, the most important case study we have is actually in Malaysia, in the uh, island of Borneo, where effectively, very similar to what uh, we did uh, for Senegal, we're trying to understand how we could uh, approach different areas uh, of the island of Borneo and uh, uh, propose different electrification schemes by different types of uh, microgrids uh, uh, to, 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 to allow electrification to uh, reach uh, as far as possible. I think there are about 40,000 villages uh, in Sarawak, uh, this area of Borneo, without, uh, uh, without electricity at the moment. So the question is, what is the optimal technical and uh, resilient solution? Uh, and uh, this is the sort of some pictures and you know, all the sort of areas that we are, we, are, we are talking about, taken from some, some colleagues from the University of Manchester again. And here, besides uh, affordability, I would like to stress, uh, there's really an issue of resilience uh, because uh, additionally to the usual problem we have with reliability 
in rural and remote areas, you also have serious issues such as flooding in those regions, but also serious issues such as uh, landslides. And many of these villages actually are in areas where on the one hand, they are basically bounded by uh, like, like landslide areas, and on the other hand, uh, by rivers and, and, and risk of flooding and all that. So it's really important how you design the microgrid as a trade-off and uh, not only in terms of economics, but also uh, you know, in, in terms of resilience, when you look at all these different events. In fact, that's the way we're approaching the problem. Effectively, less focus somehow in the context of the trilemma uh, on the, uh, the decarbonization part, but more focus on the economics and then reliability slash resilience that here I represented like white swan and Black Swan and uh, the kind of modeling that we are developing with a colleague uh, at the University of Manchester is, uh, for example, looking at how effectively different microgrid solutions, for example, would generate uh, different outcomes uh, in terms of classical reliability or resilience to more extreme events like flooding, landslides, uh, and, and all that. And this really becomes a very fine uh, uh, optimization problem that has got uh, very important. Uh, uh, en engineering outcomes, of course. So we are working very, very closely with sophisticated mathematical models, but also very, very closely to the engineers and uh, the network operators in Southern Energy. So to make sure that the uh, the solutions that we provide are actually feasible and, uh, uh, and, and applicable, most important. And uh, we're basing this on very recent research uh, that we developed uh, uh, actually in another international project uh, with, uh, uh, with Chile, uh, which uh, was the, the, the project mentioned earlier, where effectively we developed a, a tool, in that case uh, uh, designed uh, for earthquakes, but of course it's more general, where basically we demonstrate how you could optimally uh, de develop optimal trade-off between the economics of the system uh, and the resilience of the system on the extreme events and how you could plan uh, the uh, uh, future energy systems uh, considering you know these, these resilience aspects and even in the studies we performed for uh, for Chile actually uh, we had studies on microgrids where the role of microgrids was actually very very big now to conclude I wanted to finish with a famous statement uh, by Thomas Edison in 1878, so he said, uh, we'll make electricity so cheap that only the rich will burn candles. Uh, that, of course, was the dawn of a new era, not only for electricity, of course, he basically created uh, electricity, the power system it was really a new, new era for, for the world, for society. And uh, at the time, Edison had a big competitor, uh, Tesla, and I think, uh, we have uh, today another Tesla, and I believe uh, we may be witnessing the dawn of a new era, and certainly microgrids uh, might play a very important role, and the microgrids themselves, at least, all the idea of decentralization, digitalization, and new technologies that we're seeing more and more in the system. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Pierluigi, uh, for sharing your your latest uh, research, <laughs> and and and, uh, and indeed uh, also uh, not only your experiences, and um, you know, uh, working with uh, with uh, um, you know um, Australian uh, government and uh, and uh, microgrid uh, experiences for urban areas, but also uh, for uh, rural areas, uh, which uh, which is very helpful and. Um, and uh, inspiring. And now our uh, uh, next speaker uh, is 